Hello there, sword friends, specifically Shadowversity in this case. There was recently a video that was put out, I Spit on Your Sword, and uh, it was fun, and I would encourage you to watch it. It's linked in the description down below, and it talks about some of the uh, taboos of swords and if they're valid or not, and there are a couple points in there that I thought I could address or that I might be able to add some additional context or information to, but I'd encourage you to watch it and uh, think of your own things and if, if you think Shad's arguments are good or bad. But anyway, the point is there are two things that I would offer some additional context on that may be helpful or maybe not, um, but that I have some relevant experience with and I don't think were addressed in the video. So I'll talk on those and then there's one point that Chad made I agree with and I will piggyback on and say with a little bit more uh, emphasis because I, I feel like while he addressed it, it uh, you know may have flew under the radar more than it should have. So the first is damaging your sire. He used a Japanese sword, he flung it about and he said you're not going to damage the scabbard, the sire, if you slam them together. And I don't inherently disagree, particularly on the examples that Chad was using. Uh, if you have a newer sword and it is of reasonable good quality, or even if it's not, most of the time those parts are going to hold together even if you slam them together. Uh, there are some caveats to that though. One, if you're dealing with anything historic or old, which you may be able to buy, you may have access to in your area, uh, those old pieces can have somewhat brittle lacquer work on them. And if you slam them together, it's possible things will loosen up. They're also likely more more likely to be made with historic materials, uh, rice glue and such, and it, it may jostle apart either due to age, wear, brittleness, any of that kind of stuff. Also, if your habaki is tightly fit, uh, the habaki is the little blade color, the copper, brass, silver, gold, whatever, whatever have you, uh, bit of metal that is around the base of the blade before the handle. And if that is a very tight fit, slamming it together uh, could push it in further than it wants to go, and you could cause something to split there. But if your Japanese-style swords are fit the same way Shad's were in the video, where you can kind of throw them up in the air and fling them, then you are not likely to damage it by slamming it together, particularly if it's made of relatively new materials, modern materials in particular, you're not you're not as likely to break it. But I would also note something that you are likely to diminish. And if you have a sword that is well made, wherein the habaki is again well fit to the saya and it is friction fit, there should be a little bit of pinch on the uh, front and back of the blade, not usually on the sides, but on the front and back. There's some tension that holds the blade in. And so if you bend over because you see a piece of candy on the ground, you don't uh, have your sword fall out and have to catch it or endanger yourself. It's supposed to be friction fit. It's supposed to come in. It's also supposed to release with the kind of push of a finger. So it's not super tight, if you will. And repeatedly slamming it in will diminish that quicker. You can shim it. You can glue it. You can address it. Or maybe you don't want your sword to fit that way. But um, the blade collar is, is there for a few reasons, but one of them is to fit in the scabbard and have some level of friction fit. And that will diminish if you repeatedly slam it in. Uh, it will diminish, frankly, if you go very slow as well. <laughs> so that is a, it is a maintenance thing that you will have to address on a sword if you use it in that fashion eventually, uh, but it can last quite a bit longer if you don't uh, don't slam it together. So that's one reason why you, you go a little bit slower, why you're, you're trained to. It can be dramatic and cool to, to do it the other way or very loud, but a lot of times you, you go slow. Uh, in a modern context as well, it would just note that if you slam it really hard together, if you have a very poorly made saya, it's possible sometimes that the edge doesn't ride in the right spot that it's supposed to and it can bind and things can pop apart that way. Uh, but generally speaking, I, I can see the point that you're not likely to damage things. Uh, you are more likely, if you slam it repeatedly together, actually to loosen the habaki fit, which I talked about, but also loosen the suba and seppa and move some of that stuff around. The habaki is usually a softer metal than the steel of the sword. Uh, very often you don't see habaki made of steel, not to say it never happened, but it's not something that I've, I've come across. And that softer metal being slammed in is likely to uh, loosen or compress or move around in such a way that you may not like it and it will likely cause the parts to rattle. Again, all something that can be addressed, but if you want to avoid that maintenance for as long as possible, then gently sheathing the habaki or um, closing it closing it gingerly it will, will prolong the lifespan of that if you have it fit well. Um, and the, the parts from rattling. Again, you'll have to deal with all that eventually anyway, but you, you can kick that can down the road quite a bit further if you're gingerly with it. The second thing I wanted to talk about was edge on edge blocking. And some schools favor the blocking with the flat, some favor blocking with the edge. I study two different styles of Kenjutsu myself. I don't study Hema, but I have also studied Filipino martial arts and uh, more or less there's different thoughts on it and different schools favor different things. And so I would say either is viable, uh, but I would say that there's some things to note about blocking with the edge. One, uh, they do stick together. The reaction's a little bit different. And 
if you swing lightly or swing with a lot of force, uh, they also start to act a little differently with edge on edge. Uh, but one thing that maybe wasn't noted as, as clearly or wasn't clear to me is that you can maintain them. If, if you block edge on edge and your sword is diminished quite a bit, then you can you can sand it down. You can take, take those scratches, nicks, dings out and reprofile the sword so that it is viable and usable again another day. Uh, likewise, if it breaks, hopefully you, the nubbin you're left with is still viable as a weapon, but you can repurpose those and use them for something else. Uh, Nathan at Arms and Armor recently made a video where he broke his sword doing some testing and he turned the leftovers into something else, or at least part of the leftover into something else. Um, so the the notion that they were useless or bad or that you, you can't do that or that they're unviable afterwards, I would just say one, they, they weren't expected to last forever and uh, two, they could be maintained or turned into something else. And I do agree with Shad in the point that your life is worth more, though. And so I, I tend to favor the, the edge block myself. That, that seems a little bit more viable to me. Um, but it's also worth noting just in, in edge blocking or any block, most of the time there's a kata for a block. But uh, ideally those blocks are, are potentially turned into attack. So if you're agile enough and the position allows it, then ideally you don't block. And you, you put yourself on the offense and you don't block with your sword. I, I'm not very agile myself, so blocking tends to be, tends to be a thing for me. Anyway, uh, hopefully that's some interesting notes and thoughts uh, that help. The last bit that I wanted to touch on, though, was manners. And Shad touched on this, and he said, you know, do whatever you want with your own property, and you know, but don't do that with somebody else's. And those were points that he made. But let me say it with a little bit more thunder. And first, I, I unequivocally agree that you get to do whatever you want with your own property. But if you want to be part of a sword community, if you want to, if you want to touch other people's stuff, then some some table manners are warranted. Learning sword etiquette is something that I would advocate that you do. Um, in the realm of Japanese swords, in particular, if you spit on the sword, if you touch it, if you do any of that, the polish is sensitive. It's it's very pristinely polished and very clear and there's artistic qualities in it and it's very expensive to have redone. And if you wipe it with the wrong paper towel, you can diminish that polish and it can cost potentially thousands of dollars to have remedied. So spitting on it, do, doing that kind of stuff with your own property, totally fine. Do, do your thing. Uh, but if you want to see them at a show, then some etiquette uh, if, if you go to a vendor that has them, if somebody's showing you their collection, um, sticking the sword in the in the dirt. Uh, very often I've, I've damaged swords doing that, particularly with katana that tend to have very fine edges. If you have a satin polished sword and it has a very robust edge, you're less likely to have a problem with that, but doing that can scratch the surface of the sword. And if it were a very nice pristine sword, then you would likely be in, you know, on the hook for thousands of dollars. I, uh, if, if I were to show somebody a sword and they spit on it and touched it and <laughs> did all that kind of stuff, I would, I would have a chore if I saw it, but there have been times where um, folks have looked at swords of mine and not told me about it, and I've missed it, and I've missed the chore, and the polish has been diminished, and it has cost me a substantial amount of money to have remedied. Uh, there have also been times where I've asked people, hey, do you, do you know the sword etiquette? Do you know how to handle the sword? And most of the time, people that are around swords say yes. There's even very experienced smiths and collectors that have said, yeah, of course I understand it. And then they proceeded to talk moistly at the sword or thumb it or handle it or set it down on a dirty table, not on like the cloth to keep the blade clean. Um, and at least in the realm of Japanese style swords with refined polishes on them, a little bit of sand on a table that gets scraped along it. Now the, the sword surface is marred and to fix that, I have to pay somebody a substantial amount of money in the tune of a thousand or thousands of dollars potentially and wait in queue for years and risk sending it with the post office and deal with all of that stuff. So uh, knowing that and, and putting another person in that position is, is kind of a dick move. With your own property, do your thing. But I, I would I would say it's critically important if you want to be a good member of a community and see other people's stuff that you learn some of those manners and and not do that, or at least know how not to do that and, and generally reserve other people's property, hold it in a higher regard than, than you would your own and be very gingerly with it unless they give you the impression that it's okay to stick the tip in the dirt. Uh, anyway, those are some thoughts. Hopefully it's helpful. Cheers. Thanks for watching.